Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's countdown. 10 horrendous cannibal sickos that will leave you speechless. We're starting at number 10 with Issei Sagawa. Also known as the Kobe Cannibal, Issei Sagawa is a Japanese murderer, cannibal, and necrophile known for the killing of Rene Hartfeld in Paris in 1981. At the time, he was 32, pursuing a PhD in literature at the Sorbonne, a reputable college in Paris, alongside René. He befriended her and lured her into his apartment under the pretext of translating poetry for a school assignment. Sagawa planned to kill her and eat her, having selected her for her health and beauty, characteristics which he felt he lacked. Sagawa considered himself weak, ugly, and short, which he was. I mean, not to throw shade or anything, but he was 145 centimeters tall, so 4 feet 9. He claimed he wanted to absorb her energy. She was 25 years old, beautiful, tall. After Hartfeld arrived, she began reading poetry at a desk with her back to Sagawa when he shot her in the back of the neck with a rifle. He then mutilated, cannibalized, and performed necrophilia on her corpse all over the course of three days. It was the month of June, it was rather hot, and things were starting to smell. So he hastily disposed of the parts of the body that didn't fit in his fridge, in a very clumsy, messy, suspicious manner, in broad daylight, might I add. I think it might be the stupidest thing I've ever heard if he actually wanted to get away with it. More on that in a future video. So, of course, he immediately caught the attention of people passing by and made a run for it. He patiently waited for the police to knock on his door and was surprised that it still took them four days to find him. Sagawa was arrested and after being held for two years awaiting trial, he was found legally insane and unfit to stand trial by the French judge who ordered him held indefinitely in a mental institution. After a visit by the author Yomota, Sagawa's account of his kill was published in Japan and the subsequent publicity made him somewhat of a macabre celebrity. This likely contributed to the French authorities' decision to deport him back to Japan, where he was immediately committed to Matsuzawa Hospital in Tokyo. His examining psychologists all declared him sane and found sexual perversion was his sole motivation for murder. As the charges against Sagawa in France had been dropped, the French court documents were sealed and were not released to Japanese authorities. Consequently, Sagawa could not legally be detained in Japan. So he checked himself out of the hospital in the summer of 1986, about five years after the crime, and has subsequently remained free since that day, which has been widely criticized, and rightfully so. In his 24 years of freedom since the crime, Sagawa has traveled all over the world living his best life on his wealthy father's money, even accompanied by other beautiful tall foreign women who did not know about his past, which blows my mind. Back in Japan, he has experienced a certain notoriety. He has published novels, inspired songs, been the subject of countless documentaries and magazine articles, and films in which he even reenacted his crime. Effectively, he made a living off of the crime. And I'm going to quote an author from Vice here because he or she said it very well. Sagawa's punishment, he believes, is the very thing that has supported him, his fame. And the irony is not lost on him. Personally, I feel that this torment has not been punishment enough. Furthermore, I feel that perhaps the blame is just as much upon us, the public. We have been encouraging this strange man to exist in order to feed our macabre fascinations. And the irony of that is not lost on me. End quote. At number nine, we have Joe Metheny. Joseph Metheny, ironically known as Tiny, as he was six foot one and weighed around 450 pounds, was an American serial killer and self-proclaimed cannibal from Baltimore. He confessed to killing 10 people, mostly prostitutes and a few homeless men. According to his jailhouse confessions, it started out as sort of a hunting spree for his missing junkie wife and her new boyfriend, who had allegedly ran off with his six-year-old son and lost his custody on charges of child neglect and abuse. But somewhere along the process, he discovered a new passion, a passion for murder, as his passion grew, so did the violence. And rape was often a thing for him, as well as necrophilia, at least in one case, according to him. 
Here's a little snippet from an alleged jail time confession of his where he references cannibalism. I lured two more crackers up there to my trailer. I killed and butchered their bodies. I cut the meat up and put it in some Tupperware bowls, then put it in the freezer. I buried the remains in several shallow graves in a little woods behind the company. Over the next couple of weeks, on the weekends, I opened up a little open pit beef stand. I had real roast beef and pork sandwiches, and why not? They were very good. The human body tastes very similar to pork. If you mix it together, no one can tell the difference. Everything was going pretty good until I ran out of my special meat, so I lured another bitch up to my trailer, end quote. That's when he started telling the story of how she managed to escape and call the cops on him. But he finishes this little segment with, quote, So the next time you're riding down the road and you happen to see an open pit beef stand that you've never seen before, make sure you think about this story before you take a bite of that sandwich. Sometimes you never know who you may be eating. Haha. <laughs> End quote. At his sentencing, he requested to be put to death and said, Quote, the words I'm sorry will never come out, for they would be a lie. I am more than willing to give up my life for what I've done, to have God judge me and send me to hell for eternity. He ended up getting sentenced to life without parole in the year 2000 and was found dead in his prison cell in 2017 at the age of 64. He had very high levels of LDL in his blood, allegedly, so one could say that, in a way, karma kind of got to him. He turned his victims into burgers, and in turn, those burgers contributed to his health declining and eventually to his death. At number eight, we have Catherine Knight. Catherine Knight was possessive, vindictive, and had a bit of a temper. She knew how to effectively handle knives, as she had worked in a slaughterhouse in the past. She was also known to have been a to her partners in previous relationships. She is at number eight on this list because she was convicted for the murder of her partner, John Charles Thomas Price, in the year 2000. Catherine stabbed John to death, skinned him, then put his skin on a meat hook. Then she proceeded to cooking his head and parts of his body with the intention of feeding them to his children. Could you imagine? When the police who were called by John's worried colleagues, who were privy to her repetitive acts of violence against him, arrived at his house, where it all went down, they were first met with his hanging skin, which they thought were curtains, until they realized it was bloody. Then in the kitchen was a crock pot on the stove with a sort of a meat stew still cooking, and in the oven, his severed head. I cannot imagine the shock and the trauma his poor children. She is the first Australian woman to be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. She is currently imprisoned at the Silverwater Women's Correctional Center in New South Wales. Just in case you want to go visit, I bet you she's a real delight. In fact, I heard audio recordings of her in court and I can confirm she sounds a bit rough. Let's just put it that way. Number seven on the list is Clara Morova. She did the most despicable, the most revolting things that I really struggle to even report on because it makes me so sick. Why? Because she did them to her own children. So I'm going to make it quick, but if you want to skip her, feel free to go directly to number six on the list. The timestamp will show up on the screen right now. He's not much better, but let's be honest, they're all monsters. So back to Clara from the Czech Republic. She was said to be a good mother in the beginning. She was often seen playing with her two sons. However, after her husband left her, she and her sons moved in with her sister Katerina and they befriended Barbara Skarlova. The three women went on to abuse the eight and nine-year-old boys at the time who were locked in a cage in the basement where they remained for a year. They were tortured and assaulted in the most despicable ways leading up to the women holding them down and skinning their legs as they screamed and pleaded. The three women then ate the raw flesh. They even forced the boys to consume their own skin. The abuse was eventually uncovered by chance in 2007 when a neighbor who had installed a television baby monitor for his own baby picked up graphic videos from the scenes. Clara had apparently installed a television system so that she could watch the abuse from another room. The neighbor saw one of the sons with his hands tied behind his back lying naked on the floor. 
According to prosecutors, the purpose of the torture and abuse was to break the boys and enslave them for religious purposes. The three women were apparently part of a cult and said to have been brainwashed into committing these acts of torture. Clara was sentenced to nine years in prison. Katharina was sentenced to 10 and Barbara five years only. They have all since been paroled. I have read somewhere that the boys were eventually adopted by a family in the United States, but I can't confirm because I could not find a real source for that information. However, my heart goes out to these poor boys and I can only hope that they are being treated with the care, love and respect that they deserve now. At number six, we have Ratu Udre Udre. Ratu Udre Udre, pronounced Unde Unde, was a Fijian chief, Ratu meaning chief, in the north of Viti Levu, one of the Fiji islands. He was known to have consumed his enemies in battle for years on end. He didn't consider them as people, but as spoils of battle. Since the Fiji islands were known as the cannibal islands, as many sailors and missionaries alike had reported witnessing literal massacres, it is not surprising that he would have consumed many. But he grew to love it so much that he continued to have human meat delivered to him until his death. During more peaceful times, he was feared by the women and children especially since when his meat supply would start running low, he would send his soldiers to go out and bring him back a random victim. He would sound the lali, a type of drum that resonates from afar, and that meant for his soldiers that it was time to go hunt, and it meant for the villagers that it was time to go hide. He didn't want any last bit to go to waste and would always carry pieces of cooked and ready to eat meat on him in a little box. He would cook the meat over and over to keep it from spoiling too fast because after the British had colonized the islands and after the arrival of Catholicism, he stopped sharing his meals and ate everything himself. Some say that he was hoping to fulfill an ancient prophecy according to which the one who ate a thousand people would be granted immortality. Unfortunately for him, and fortunately for others around him, at the time of his death, he was short by 218 people. Had he not been shot to death by Fijian government officials in 1840, he might actually have achieved his goal. It is said that he consumed 782 different people, as he kept a stone for each that he had eaten, and this number matches the number of stones meticulously arranged in circles around his tomb to this day. In a way, he did gain a certain level of immortality because he is still talked about and his tomb has become somewhat of a tourist attraction. Furthermore, he detains and will forever hold, at least I hope, the Guinness World Record title of the most prolific cannibal in history. Now, I struggled a lot to rank these, so I had to ask Google Stats for help. But let me know in the comments below who, in those first five, you think is the worst and why. I have my personal opinion, although it might be controversial. I will make it known in part two, in case you haven't already guessed it. I've rambled long enough for this video, since I want to keep these short, you will discover the final five most horrendous cannibal sickos that will leave you speechless in part two of this video, coming out next week, so stay tuned. In the meantime, if you want to hear another cannibal story, check out my deep dive video on infamous Leonardo Cianciulli right here. If you haven't done it yet, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss an episode, ring the bell and like the video if you liked it, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!